Hello everyone, this is Direwolf20, and welcome to a brand new mod spotlight on a mod that I haven't really played too much with yet recently. You guys haven't really seen me use it in any seasons, but it's a mod that a lot of people have requested and wanted to check out, and it can do a lot of cool stuff. I started playing with it and said, yeah, this totally deserves a mod spotlight. Let's take a look. At Ender IO. Ender IO is a mod that can do a whole bunch of cool stuff. It's uh, based on kind of like an Ender Power style system. There's a bunch of different things it can do. It's got a handful of machines that you can play with, uh, a couple very cool nifty little gadgets that you can uh, come up with, and it's even got some pretty cool looking uh, blocks and stuff. One of the most powerful features of Ender IO is its ability uh, with its different conduits. So we're going to check out the conduit system. I haven't decided yet if I'm going to have a whole episode dedicated to conduits just because they're that powerful and there's so many different things you can do with them uh, and then of course there's just like a handful of other toys and gadgets there's also some armor and some tools that you can go ahead and build so ender io has a bunch of neat stuff we're going to start checking it out right now to see what we can do with ender io all right guys to get started showing you the mod first i'm going to show you some of the blocks that can make some of the components in the mod then we're going to show you uh some of the other blocks that are available for making cool stuff there's also some power generation that i'll get to that's pretty neat so one of the first ones i want to show you is the alloy smeltery now this does require rf power so it's a thermal expansion power system and as you can see um it's got a pretty nifty GUI here you basically put three blocks in as an input and then you'll get one block out as an output what's really nice about this is there's a recipe button on pretty much all the machines that make stuff and you can click that to get a pretty quick idea of how to make stuff uh, so you can see you can get invar ingots uh, from thermal expansion as well as electrum ingots the same recipe that you would use in the thermal expansions uh, block there and as you can also see there's about 190 pages worth of recipes so there's a lot of stuff you can put in here um, there's a good handful of things you can get things like uh, fused quartz which is a special type of glass uh, there's dark steel which we'll definitely want to know about that's something that's going to be used quite a bit in this mod and a handful of other things redstone alloy um, and some other stuff. So I want you guys to know about the existence of this block because um, some of the items you're going to need to make are going to be used in the alloy smeltery. Um, so you're going to want to pretty much know how that thing works. So that's the alloy smeltery. There's also this nifty thing, furnace mode. So you can switch it to all smelting or alloys only. Pretty cool. Or furnace only or all smelting again. So what this means is that uh, this thing can act as just a regular old furnace. For example, I can throw iron ore into this thing, but uh, only if it's in a mode that accepts uh, furnace or uh, normal you know, furnace mode. So furnace mode, furnace only, uh, you'll notice that I can place the iron block in there. Cool, but uh, if we change this to furnace mode, which is alloys only, uh, you see it can't accept iron ore, even with this block removed. So in the alloy smelting mode, uh, you can only smelt new alloys together, which is what you can see in the recipe screen here. Uh, you can't put, for example, cobblestone in there. But if you were, for example, in furnace mode, you could put cobblestone in and it'll turn it into stone. So it can act like a furnace or an alloy smeltery, or you can put it in all smelting mode and then it'll work for both, which is you can place like iron or iron ore in there and it'll accept both items. Pretty cool. Now, one of the other things you can configure is uh, it's redstone mode. So it's always active or it's only active with a redstone signal or without a redstone signal or never active mode. So you can go ahead and toggle this very similar to the thermal expansion machines with a similar configuration. What else is cool is you can configure the size of the block and how they interact. However, it's a little different from the way you configure it with thermal expansion. In this one, when you click this configure I.O., you can see a pretty nifty uh, little representation of the block. And you can hold left click to turn it around and you can see the block on all six sides and you can specify what sides do what so for example uh, I could click on this side and right click and you'll see that it's in pull mode which means it'll pull items out of the adjacent inventory or push mode which means it'll push items out of the adjacent inventory and you'll notice that when you mouse over a side it colors in one of these blocks so when we were in um, pull mode or pull push mode or disabled or none. So in pull mode, you'll see that it highlights the blue section. In push mode, you can do orange. And then uh, when we go ahead and place cobblestone in there, for example, and it smelts up the cobblestone, it should automatically push the cobblestone into the chest. Neat. Now you'll notice that I put it in pull mode, which means it'll automatically pull from an adjacent chest. So I can throw cobblestone in the chest, and you'll notice that it's automatically pulled into the alloy smelter, and it's cooked up. Nice. And finally, I'm going to put this guy in push-pull mode, which is really cool, which means it'll go ahead and pull items that it can uh, deal with out of the chest adjacent to it, and it'll automatically output it to the same chest. So if you want to, you can just kind of throw all your cobblestone in here, and it'll just start smelting away. Very nice. 
What's also cool about this uh, machine, if you're paying really close attention, you might have noticed, is it smells three items at a time. So you can see right here we've got 53 cobblestone, and it's going to go ahead and uh, convert that into uh, three pieces of smooth stone and pull three more cobblestone in. So you can see it can cook three time, three items at a time. It does take three times as long, though, so it's not like you're getting it, you know, instantly, or it's not, you know one-third the speed of it. It's uh, Basically it takes three times as long to smelt as it would uh, just a normal thing. So if we give this a second to finish up what it's currently working on and place only one item in there, you'll know it's a lot quicker. So there we go. Finished up the three. And now it's smelting the one. You'll notice it's a lot faster to smelt that one block versus the three blocks. But a pretty neat mechanic. So the final two modes to show you here are none versus disabled. So in none mode, it doesn't push or pull the items automatically, but it will accept items from things like hoppers or item conduits or pipes or any other mod that can push items around, like buildcraft pipes, for example. So if you piped an item into here, it would go into the input slot. And if you pulled an item out with like a wooden pipe or, uh, you know, an item extractor from... Uh, extra utilities or something like that, it would pull it out of the output slot. So in none mode, it doesn't actually do a push or a pull, but it will allow the player to interact with it using build graph pipes or some other piping system. And then finally in disabled mode, it'll prevent any pipes from connecting to it. So for example, right now, the right side is in none mode and you can see the pipe is connected and it's also connected on the back. But if I were to go in here and configure this to disabled mode, you'll see this representation of the pipe being disconnected, and that's how it looks in the world as well. So the pipe is no longer connected to that side of the block. Very cool. And then finally, there's this nifty little slot right here. This is an upgrade slot, which allows you to upgrade the machine. Now, there's several types of upgrades that are available in Ender.io. Uh, one of the ones you're going to look at first is uh, the, the basic capacitor, which in this machine doesn't do anything. Uh, however, there's the double-layered capacitor, which requires some energetic alloys, which we are going to find out how to smelt using this machine. And then finally, there's the octadic capacitor, which requires a couple double layers and some vibrant alloys. These guys are a little bit expensive. They do require an ender pearl and some energetic alloy. Uh, the energetic alloy being gold, redstone, and glowstone. Not terrible, but definitely, you know, a bit of a process to get. So the double layer capacitor is going to increase the energy storage. So you can see we can now store up to 200,000 RF in the machine. However, the machine's operation requires 60 RF per tick as opposed to the default 20 without it. So you can see here, now we've got 60 RF per tick. It's also going to, of course, increase the speed of the machine. So for example, we throw our cobblestone in there and it smelts much faster than it smelted without that upgrade. Very cool. And the octadic capacitor right here, this guy is going to increase it a lot. It's going to require 100 RF per tick. So that's five times the energy use uh, of the basic 20. And it also has five times the storage. So it can store 500,000 RF as opposed to the default 100,000. And of course, it's going to smelt things a lot faster. Boom. Check that out. Very cool. And of course, it can still smelt three things at a time. So the three items at a time are smelting pretty quickly in this nifty alloy smeltery. Very cool. So that covers the alloy smeltery, and it also covers some other things like the siding system and the upgrade system. So most machines we're going to see have this kind of configurable siding. Most of them have the recipes, most of them have the redstone control, and have the ability to upgrade using these capacitors. So you're going to want to keep all these things in mind as you're playing around with the mod. One of the other machines you're going to want to know about is called the VAT. This is a machine that can craft liquids for you. So while the uh, alloy smeltery goes ahead and crafts items, the VAT crafts liquids. And you can, of course, see that there's a recipe section here as well. So, for example, there's several things you can get, uh, one of them being hooch, which is a nifty little liquid we'll check out in a little bit. And there's multiple items you can use to make hooch. So primarily you're going to need sugar. Um, and then the other thing you're going to need is some kind of food item. And you can see here that the different food items have different uh, powers. So for example, example, if you throw a poisonous potato in there, you'll get a strong, large amount of hooch out of it, as opposed to seeds, which looks like to be the smallest. You can also get yourself some rocket fuel, which is a combination of hooch with gunpowder and redstone. This is going to be used in one of the generators a little bit later. Uh, and you can, of course, also see the RF cost per um, you know bucket worth of stuff. Uh, finally, you can get nutrient distillation, something we'll also be using a little bit. Um, it requires a bunch of different items that all have different multipliers in them, right? So you can go with zombie flesh, you can go with pork chops, and you can go with skeleton heads and sugar and mushrooms. So all these different combinations give you different uh, things that you can get.
So you're going to want to try different items to go and figure out like the best way to get your nutrient distillation out of water. And then finally, fire water is uh, hooch, which is uh, blaze powder and redstone. So a couple different uh, recipes here. We're going to see what some of those liquids do in just a little bit. And then the last machine uh, that you're going to need to craft some of the prerequisite stuff is right here. This guy is called the Slice and Spice. This allows you to make a bunch of different items that are going to be used uh, mostly as crafting components later down the line. And there's some more planned for it in the future, I believe, as well. So one of the things you're going to have to give it is an axe and some shears. Uh, go ahead and place those guys in there, and they will take damage every time they do a crafting operation, so you're going to have to replace them occasionally. Um, some of the things you're able to make with them are zombie controllers and zombie electrodes, and you can also get yourself a tormented enderman head using an enderman head why do you think i like this mod <laughs> so this is going to be something we're going to check out uh, again what we're going to use those for is going to be seen in just a bit so now that we've had a chance to take a look at some of the machines that require power and there's still a few more that we haven't looked at yet i want to show you some of the power gen options in ender io so most mods have a power gen system um, like this one that can go ahead and burn fuel to generate power so this guy can go ahead and generate power based on the type of fuel you put in there. You'll notice that when you mouse over, you can see the burn time. Uh, you've got a burn rate of 2x, which means it's going to burn twice as fast without any upgrades in it. It generates 20 RF per tick. And you can see here it's got its own little internal capacitor of about 100,000 RF. So this can be used to charge your energy cells. It's basically any type of generator, very much the same. You can, of course, also place upgrades in there. So you can now see we're producing 40 RF per tick at a burn rate of 1.5 times. So you're burning faster, but generating more power. And then finally, uh, the last upgrade, 80 RF per tick uh, for a burn rate of 1.5. So this guy is definitely going to boost up your uh, production of power very much. So clearly when you go ahead and boost up these things with capacitors, you're going to have more efficiency and more RF per tick. Very cool. So next up we have the combustion generator. Uh, this guy is going to burn liquid fuels and generate power, but it requires a coolant. For example, water. Uh, so you can go ahead and toss some water in this thing, and you'll notice that it's got this little internal area where the water flows into first, and then uh, further subsequent amounts of water going in there will go ahead and uh, fill up this coolant section right there. So you can see plenty of water goes in and uh, keeps the combustion engine cool. You're going to want to make sure that you do that. Uh, and then over here on the left is uh, the fuel section. There's many different types of fuel that you can use, each with varying amounts of power output and duration. So for example, uh, hooch, which we saw how to make earlier, uh, can go ahead and have a 60 RF per tick for 6,000 tick burn time. Uh, so that, you know, isn't terrible, uh, but we've got better, of course. So over we've got rocket fuel, 160 uh, RF per tick for a 7,000 burn time, so definitely a lot better. Uh, you can also get fire water. This has a long burn time at about 80 RF per tick. Uh, and then, of course, you can also use things like uh, biomass from forestry, ethanol from forestry, oil, and fuel. So you can see long fuel time for uh, a burn time for fuel and a decent uh, 60 RF per tick. So lots of different options. So, for example, if we threw some rocket fuel in there, sounds like a good time. Uh, you'll notice that it's producing, like we said, 160 RF per tick, and it's going ahead and burn running up through that uh, rocket fuel. Now the last thing we're going to show you guys is the zombie generator. This requires some electrical steel, which is another one of those alloy smelteries. It requires silicon, coal dust, iron. Silicon, by the way, uh, is produced in a sag mill. One of the blocks I haven't shown you yet, but I'll show you in just a minute. Uh, and this guy also requires one of those zombie electrodes, which we saw from the Slice and Spice. This is a nifty and kind of funny generator. Uh, basically, it requires some of that nutrient distillation. Uh, we saw that we make that with all kinds of different mob drops and mushrooms or sugar or something along those lines. Lots of different things you can use uh, for the nutrient distillation and basically once you throw that in there you'll notice that nothing's happening this only works when the internal uh, tank is 70 percent or more full so it needs to be pretty much topped off and then it's going to generate a nice 80 rf per tick and slowly drain some of that nutrients out of there so nutrient distillation i think it's used for one or two other things in the mod that we'll check out in a bit but for now this is a neat way to generate power and you'll also notice that you can uh, configure the output sides here if you want push, uh, pull, and disabled. So you can see that we can pull uh, liquids into here this way. Nice. So one of the machines I mentioned to you uh, that we'd be seeing next is the sag mill. Uh, so this is kind of like your ore multiplication machine. It's going to allow you to do a bunch of different stuff, however. Uh, we can see some of the recipes here. So for example, uh, if we got uranium ore, we could get some eulorium dust. That's kind of cool. And there's a bunch of different other things you can do with it. So let's slip through here. We'll see, for example, um, obsidian, get you some obsidian dust uh, with a chance of getting some uh, 
speedier stuff if you throw flint or dark steel balls in there. I'll show you what that's all about in just a minute. So this is basically uh, your ore doubling mechanic. So for example, gold ore gets you gold powder uh, with a 20% chance of copper powder and some cobblestone at 15% chance. So just to demonstrate, if we were to, for example, throw some iron ore into this thing, uh, you'll notice that it's going to go ahead and chew it up and spit out some dust. Beautiful, just like we would expect. And of course, you can go ahead and throw some upgrades in there, and you'll notice that you're going to produce things a lot faster. So much faster operation with that. So you'll notice right now with the iron ore, we're getting some iron powder, some pulverized ferrous metal every now and then, and some cobblestone every now and then. Now what's cool is you can actually throw either flint or dark steel balls into this slot here. You'll notice that flint gives you a main output increase of 120%. So you've got a chance of getting just a little bit more out of your operations when you're using flint. Uh, you also have 125% of bonus output and power reduction 15%. Okay. Now, if you go ahead and throw a dark steel ball in there, which is a lot more expensive, requires five dark steel uh, to get some dark steel balls in there, that'll give you a 150% output boost with a 200% bonus output production chance. So let's go ahead and throw those in there. Uh, these things also have a bit of duration. So for example, if I throw this in here, uh, you'll notice that it eats up the ball and has just a little bit of a loss. So you'll notice here we're having a chance to get a lot more stuff out of our operations. Um, so with the dark steel ball, it's about 150% output boost. So on average, you'll probably get about three ore dust uh, per iron ore versus the two. So obviously a pretty cool machine, especially once you upgrade it. You're going to need to produce a lot of these dark steel balls, uh, especially if we want to keep this thing full. It very quickly burns through them. And of course, flint lasts a lot uh, less than the dark steel ball does. So that's pretty much your best upgrade, but you can use flint for a minor upgrade. All right, two more types of power production that I'm going to show you guys, photovoltaic cells. Uh, these guys are basically your solar power generators. Uh, these produce 10 RF per tick, so a very small and measly amount of power. But then again, it works just on power of the sun, and it only, of course, works during uh, daylight hours, and you need a clear line of sight to the sky, so don't place it underneath any trees or anything. Uh, go ahead and place this guy down, and you should start seeing him generating some power. It doesn't have an interface, uh, but you can go ahead and place some kind of block next to it to accept power to see it working. So if we were to get ourselves uh, a cell here, this thing will start filling up in just a moment. Oh, but one thing to note is that these energy cells only export their power below. So if you want to hook it up directly to an energy cell, you're going to want to put it on top of it. And you'll notice we're getting a very small amount of power out of this. Uh, of course, there is an upgraded version, the advanced photovoltaic cell. This thing, however, is pretty expensive. Uh, you're going to need some vibrant alloys, some vibrant crystals, which require emeralds and more vibrant alloy nuggets. Uh, you're also going to need some pulsating iron, which is uh, another one of those alloy smelteries, ender pearl plus iron. So a couple different things you're going to need in order to get this thing. Uh, the vibrant alloys, of course, are a little bit pricey as well. So keep that in mind. Uh, but once you've got them, you can go ahead and produce 40 RF per tick, again, from daylight. So again, not a huge amount of power, but pretty nice. You should also note that uh, the output of 40 RF per tick is a best case scenario. So that's only when it's around noon time. When the sun is low in the sky, it's going to be producing less power. Uh, when it's high in the sky, it's going to be producing more. And if it's raining, it's going to be producing a lot less. Think of them kind of just like the uh, vanilla daylight sensor, where the strength of the redstone is dependent on how much light is hitting it. It's pretty similar to that. The next machine I want to show you guys is an auto crafter. Pretty nifty uh, mechanic right here. Basically, it's an RF powered auto crafting machine. And you can see I've already done a little bit of testing with this. All you have to do is place your pattern in the left side here. So, you know, place in blocks or click and hold. There you go. You'll notice that you get a furnace. In this inventory slot is where you place the items to be crafted with. And you'll notice that it's producing pretty much what you would expect. Nice. And of course, they can be upgraded with uh, some capacitors as well if you want to make them craft a little bit faster. Very cool. And just like most machines, you can configure their inputs and outputs so you can pull directly and output directly to an adjacent chest. So for example, if I want to get a bunch of furnaces and I had a chest adjacent to this thing, like so, I just place a bunch of cobblestone in there and I will get a bunch of furnaces. Nice. 
All right, next thing I want to show you guys is a couple of the nifty gadgets that Ender IO comes with. Uh, there's quite a few cool things you can make. For example, one of my favorites are the travel anchors. Now these guys do require a pulsating crystal, which is a diamond surrounded by some of those pulsating iron nuggets that we saw earlier. Uh, these guys, of course, being ender pearl and iron. So you're going to need to get a handful of uh, decent materials for this. What it is is basically a medium range, I'll say, teleporter. So I can come over here and place this thing right here. Now what's cool about this is you'll notice that there's really nothing going on in the world right now. However, when I stand on one of these travel anchors, you'll see that another travel anchor in the immediate area is highlighted and I can mouse over it and it gets larger. And if I jump, I'll teleport right over to it. Awesome. And when I stand on this one, I'll see that one. So clearly these things can be used as a very cool teleportation mechanic. And you can see right here, I'll go ahead and place this one down. So when I'm on it, I can choose to go to either destination just by mousing over and jumping. And boom, I made it. Very cool. Make sure you're standing on the thing and go. Awesome. Now you might imagine that once you have many of these blocks in your world, you might have trouble differentiating which one is where, especially when you might not know exactly what's what. What you can do is open it up and go ahead and place any item in the world in there. So you can go ahead and put dirt, for example, in this one. And I'm gonna head over to this guy and I'll place a diamond ax, for example. Now when I'm standing on a teleporter and I mouse over it, I'll see something like a dirt block or a diamond ax block. So you can kind of see you can, you can mark what you want it to be. And of course, there's also a nifty little uh, system of public, protected, and private. So in protected mode, unfortunately, I can't demonstrate this too well to you uh, because it's only the player who places it is always allowed to use it. Uh, but in protected mode, you can place what's kind of like a password in here. So you can place, you know, different blocks or items inside to make a password. And then when a user attempts to teleport to this, they have to enter the password uh, to be able to use it. And then in private mode, only the player who placed this can teleport to it. So it'll be a little tricky for me to demonstrate that, but I think you guys get the idea. And of course, in public mode, anyone can access it. Cool. Now there's another item that's going to be pretty useful and can actually be used with these things. And that is right over here. It's called the Staff of Traveling. Okay. The recipe for this thing is uh, not terribly complex. It does require some dark steel and an ender crystal, uh, which requires a soul binder. We're going to get into the soul binder in a little bit. Uh, but what this thing is, is basically an item that can be used to travel anywhere you want just by mousing over the area. So you don't actually have to be on one of these things. Uh, without the Staff of Traveling, you have to stand on one to travel to another. But with a Staff of Traveling, you can travel to any one. Now these guys, um, you know, I think you have to right click. There it is, not jump. Nice. So I can be anywhere out in the world, just right click and boom, teleport right over. It does have a range though. It's not an infinite range. I think it's pretty much your view distance. So don't think you can be, you know, a thousand miles away and teleport back to this thing. It's pretty much as far as you can see is as far as you can teleport. So it's not like an infinite range, but it's pretty good. Um, and of course, with the staff of traveling, it's very cool being able to teleport. This would be nice for, you know, teleporting into different nearby locations or maybe set up a chain of them to get from one location to another. Lots of different mechanics that you can do uh, with the travel anchor. Uh, with the Staff of Traveling, by the way, I think you can shift right click to teleport, by the way, just a little bit forward. So you can see right here, I'm teleporting forward a bunch of different distances, very cool. And we can kind of see there's one, there's two, but I don't think I can see the, th oh wait, I can. Yep, I can see all three in the distance there. It's nice, you can actually see them from, um, you know, through blocks and all that other stuff. Again, only while holding the Staff of Traveling or when standing on another travel anchor can you see them. Nice. Now the next block, which is very cool and kind of works very much like this, is a block unlike any that I've seen in any other mod. It's called the Ender IO which takes its namesake from the name of the mod. This is pretty much a very unique block. It's very cool. What I'm gonna do is place the Ender IO block right there, cool? What it does is it allows remote access to machines in the immediate vicinity while standing on a travel anchor. So for example, I'm gonna pop over to this travel anchor right here. And you'll notice that the Ender IO is highlighted just like the travel anchors are. And when I jump, 
I get an immediate area vicinity of what's around the, the uh, Ender I.O. I want to say it's like a seven block radius. You can hold left click to look around and you can kind of see a bunch of blocks. So I want to say that's seven blocks, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, definitely pretty close to seven block range. And uh, what you can do then is right click on any block to interact with it. So for example, if I wanted to see how much power was in my uh, energy cell right here, I could right click on it and we'll see the hardened energy cells interface. Once I close that interface, I'm back to where I was originally and I have to jump again in order to interface and I can check out how my uh, auto crafting machine is doing. Cool. I can interact with the chest here and I can pull the furnaces out of the chest and now I'm back where I'm at and I have those furnaces. So I can interact with uh, pretty much any uh, block in the world provided that I'm standing on this thing and I can take a look at it. Cool. So you can see here there's the chest. I can place the furnaces back in and boom. Very cool. Uh, and of course, just like with the Staff of Traveling being able to teleport to blocks, you can right click on an Ender IO from a distance and you can interact with stuff as well. So you can interact your, with your machines remotely courtesy of the Ender IO. Now, I don't think there's any way to place or remove blocks. It's really just for interacting with machines and seeing how stuff is doing. Oh look, my generator is full. Good to know. One of the other machines I want to show you before we wrap up this episode is the painting machine. Now I can do a lot more than what I'm about to show you, uh, but I do want to give you kind of the, the basics of what it can do. The painting machine allows you to paint certain blocks to look like others. For example, uh, the travel anchor is one of those blocks that can be painted. So on the left slot here, you place the block that you want it to look like, and you can put all kinds of different blocks in here. I'm going to choose cobblestone, of course, but you can use bricks, you can use uh, all kinds of stuff. I think even some tile entities work. Uh, and you can place one travel anchor in there, and you'll see it'll eat up the travel anchor and it'll start painting it for you and then once the painting process is complete you've got a travel anchor that looks like cobblestone cool and uh, I can go ahead and place this in the world right next to some other cobblestone and then when I stand on it you'll notice that it looks like a travel anchor and of course when I'm trying to access it while looking at other travel anchors I'll see it there but then you know otherwise it just looks like cobblestone very nice so these travel anchors can fit right inside your base and look like you know just like the rest of the base uh, I can use pretty much any solid block uh, as long as it's a square so there's a lot of different things you could use uh, to make these travel anchors look like very cool do keep in mind, however, there is no way to unpaint a block. Um, you could repaint it as itself. So like if you had another travel anchor in here, you could do something like this um, and it would, you know, appear again as a travel anchor. Neat. Um, but keep that in mind because, you know, you, it's a little tricky to unpaint. You'd need to have another one. Uh, so make sure you've uh, chosen something. You could, of course, also repaint it as something else. So if you wanted to make it look like, you know, stone brick instead of cobblestone, you could easily just repaint it as well. And there's actually quite a lot of cool stuff you can paint. For example, you can take some vanilla carpeting and paint that to look like other stuff. So if I wanted, uh, you know, a piece of carpet that looked like uh, one of these guys, the travel anchor, I could do so. Or a piece of carpet that looks like dirt. And you'll notice here that I can place this just like any other piece of carpet, but it has the texture of the item that it was painted as. Pretty cool. The painter can be used for a bunch of different things. Uh, I'm going to get into some of the other uses of the painter in the next episode. All right, and honestly, this is the last one I'll show you this episode. We've got the vacuum chest. This is pretty cool. It's a chest that acts like a vacuum. Pretty simple and straightforward. Nothing terribly fancy about it. Uh, it has a decent range, as we can see here. I want to say it's like seven blocks or so, but it might even be a little bit. Yeah, about seven blocks. That looks about right. Very cool. So we'll see here that this thing has a decent range. Let's see, maybe here. There we go. And now it's getting pulled. So the vacuum chest, pretty straightforward how it operates. Um, but pretty nice. And of course, uh, you'll notice also that when you pick it up, it retains its contents. That's cool. All right, guys, I think that about wraps it up for part one of the Ender IO Mod Spotlight. There's another part coming. There's a crazy conduit system, which I can't wait to show you guys because it's a very complicated and very cool conduit system, which is like just lots of fun. And there's a whole power system and capacitor banks and nifty things to check out. There's also a couple other nifty gadgets to check out in Ender IO as well. So, for example, there's things like uh, farming stations, there's wireless chargers, uh, there's dimensional transceivers, there's the reservoir powered spawners killer joe which is kind of cool uh you've got the attractor and aversion obelisks and experienced obelisks there's just a bunch of stuff that we haven't had a chance to check out yet in part one so we'll definitely be back for part two 
I think maybe even part three. We'll see how quickly I can get through some of the stuff. And of course, there's also this whole armor set, which has a crazy amount of upgrade options that can do some really neat stuff, as well as some tools with lots of different upgrade options as well. This sword is probably my favorite sword in the game right now. Enderman can teleport once hit. Yes, please. All right, guys, for now, Direwolf20 signing off. Hope you enjoyed part one of the Ender.io Spotlight. Take it easy.